Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nine Inning Know It All podcast. I am your host, Josh. And man, this is day, I think I figured out this is day 26 uh, of no sports for me. And that's a that's a long time without sports. I mean, no basketball, no baseball, obviously, no football, no hockey, no golf, track, tennis, anything. And it is, it's crazy. It is crazy to not have anything at all going on. But at the same time, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, today's guest, guys, is going to be Ben Re- uh, Ben Reindahl. Reindahl? I don't know how to say the last name perfectly clear uh, because I am not good with names, but I think it's Reindahl. So with that, guys, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's one of those things where this has been so interesting to – not have uh, all this stuff that I'm used to having going on. And I've been kind of just at a loss for what to do at times. And, you know, I know a lot of people out there are feeling the same way. We're just not having an idea of, of what to do, what to, you know, and that's really why I have the podcast right now. I have the podcast because it gives people something to do, something to talk about, you know, something to get their minds off of what's going on. And, that's really what it's all about. And I, I do want to give a huge shout out to uh, a number of people who have been supporting Not Even Know It All. We've got the, uh, a number of supporters on Patreon who are helping keep the site going, help keep the podcast going, just keeping things going. Uh, also had a someone individual just the other day who actually gave a one-time donation to help pay for things to keep it going. Because right now, you know, there's no there's no money coming in from photographs, you know, from freelance work that I I would do during the sports year. And so, man, any little bit helps out, gets, keeps the site going, keeps the podcast going. And I think the podcast has been going pretty good. I uh, did the math this morning and uh, of the 13 episodes, there's been over 700 uh, individuals or 700 times a podcast has been listened to. So that's a pretty big number. I mean, honestly, at this point, I was expecting to, to maybe even not even have this many podcasts just because wouldn't have that many guests, wouldn't have that much to talk about, but man, I've had guests all the time, left and right. It's been crazy. In fact, you know, like I said, if you listen to yesterday's podcast uh, with Kyle Treadway, I, I've got someone every day this week, Monday through Friday, next week, I've got people Tuesday through Friday, but I'm actually talking with someone about taking the Monday spot. So that's covered. The next week I have multiple people lined up. The week after that, I've got people lined up. I mean, the only thing I don't have scheduled out right now is going into May. And that's just because I haven't started scheduling May. And I think I could. I think I could probably get half of May scheduled out if I had to right now. But, you know, kind of taking it a little bit slower just so I make sure – People aren't waiting a month to be on the podcast. At the same time, though, it's been crazy seeing everybody come on, everybody, you know, just wanting to talk baseball and softball. And in fact, last night I got a message from from someone who I never met, didn't know, didn't follow on Twitter. And they were like, hey, I, I coach this, I coach here, and I want to talk baseball. Can I come on? I was like, yeah, that that works. And you know, this morning I had another person message me saying, hey, you know, I want to talk baseball too. I'm a coach here. Can I come on? And yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people are, they're enjoying the podcast, having fun with it. And that's really what this is all about. It's about having some fun, having a moment just to forget about what's going on with everything around us and just enjoy and remember the games that we love. But guys, enough of that. Let's jump into it. Ben, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Josh? I am doing pretty good, and it's been a little crazy down here for me, obviously not covering games, but what's it like for you as a coach to not have games going on right now? It's wild. I mean, um, first time for me in 14 years that I haven't coached during the spring season, so um, trying to figure out a new normal, um, as obviously all, all of our players and other coaches are doing and stuff, so yeah, it's kind of crazy. Uh, first time in 14 years not being able to um, be on the sidelines and at the practice field and in the cage coaching. So it's kind of odd. And then Ben, you are the head coach for, for Shoreline Community College, a part of the NWAC. And the NWAC for me has a special place as I cover that baseball and softball wise a lot. But a lot of people don't realize, this, especially people outside the Northwest, both softball and baseball are very high level talent, you know, 
conferences. So what's it like for you? Because you're in the North region where there's a lot of great teams. What's it like to compete against those teams and to have that talent level here in the Northwest? You know, this is, this is my fifth year now in the NWAC and um, overall. And, and I was just thinking about this this morning, talking to a couple of coaching friends of mine that the NWAC is, is really a breeding ground for just awesome development currently. Baseball and softball, as, as you mentioned, I'm really close with our baseball coach, Dave Snell, and, um, and then some of the North baseball coaches as well, and um, as well as the softball. And, it, you know, baseball for years has been such a high-level product. Um, and softball now in the last five years, um, that I've been around here has, has gotten better every single year. I mean, just looking at what, you know, Cheryl, you know, Gilmore and Leah are doing up in um, at Western and turn that program around and, and, and just the coaches in the NWAC are just getting, getting good. You know, I think they're using a lot of the tools and, and, and data um, to just help these student athletes uh, become their best. Yeah, I know. Just really for me, I've seen kind of softball as a whole in the Northwest improving. You know, you know, University of Washington's had great programs, but even now you're seeing Oregon be more competitive. You're seeing Oregon State, you know, just the Northwest seems to be improving. And, you know, for me, I think a lot of that comes down to the, you know, the two-year colleges are producing talent, sending them off. And, you know, it's really making a big difference when you look at the, the just the level of talent, for the, once again, for the Northwest. Yeah, I think I think the Northwest, as far as baseball and softball development for years, has been has been has been great. The Northeast, in a way, as well. You see so many indoor facilities, and so much of the training is is focused on you know cage work and and, and being in the weight room, and because of our our weather and our climate. Um, whereas in the Southwest and the West and the South, you 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 get outside and you get a lot of reps and you play so many innings and all that. Um, and so I think there's a huge influx of players from the Northwest. Um, you know, being drafted and, and getting to Division One schools um, because of, of the development process that's been around here for, for years with, with the great facilities. Yeah, and then, like, even for, for you at Shoreline, you've had a number of play, players the last couple of years um, earn awards in the NWAC and go on to play for your schools. In fact, you even had, you've had players uh, go on and play at the SEC, you know, which obviously is one of the top conferences in the country for college softball. Yeah, uh, Casey Vitved uh, was our third baseman a couple years ago um, from Monroe High School up up north, and um, she came here and just you know she she was just one of those kids who had a real um, desire to be great, um, and that's kind of what we want out of our our student athletes when we recruit them, um, and and she just was relentless, you know. And I'll, I'll be honest, I mean she, you know, I reached out to some schools, we had some interest kind of locally. Um, you know, not a lot of huge offers, and and Ole Miss was the the, the school who kind of took her seriously and um, went down the the process of, of recruiting her a little bit and getting to know her, and um, and she's she's blossomed there as far as um, I can tell with with just um, loving it down there and 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 developing as well. So yeah, and then you know for for up here for recruiting, you know, you mentioned that you know I know a lot of teams they already had kind of their 2020 class figured out, but you know looking at the fact that we're missing out on the high school season, that puts a lot of challenges on recruiting. So what are some things that, you know, you and, and other NWAC coaches are having to figure out without having that ability to see the kids play through their high school year? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, over the last couple of years, you know, things like NCSA and field level and, um, and just the availability of, of video has been huge. Um, already and so it's just you know I think coaches who are maybe you know really banking on going out and seeing those high school teams and stuff like that maybe we'll have to make that 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 transition over to um recruiting online but I think you're seeing it now with with you know the draft and stuff too where um you know they're not out scouting you know bird dogging these players um every single game and, and trailing them so I think everyone's kind of making that transition as as we all are with work working from home and you know, telehealth and all those things, it's kind of a real um, change of the landscape. It's been in a lot of different fields. And so coaching is that and recruiting is that is the same with that, where, you know, you got to be able to analyze, analyze video. And um, it's something that we've been doing here for a, a long time. And we recruit, you know, um, Hawaii and, and California and, and other states like that. So to get to those players, you have to kind of know what you're doing as far as evaluating talent on, online. So. 
Yeah, definitely. I know the other day when I interviewed uh, Jay Miller, a uh, softball community college coach in, in Florida, he was saying that really you can tell a player by a player's swing if they're the type of swing that you want to work with and, and kind of do that just with a, a short video. So, you know, video really has become pretty important. And even things like social media has been big in trying to let players be seen and even let teams and organizations let show the players, hey, this is what we're looking for. So people know there's a lot more information out there than ever before. And yeah, and I think it's definitely a two way street where I think if, you know, seeing someone swing in, in a few swings definitely is something that, that I think coaches can, can grasp onto and get an idea of. And I think just starting the dialogue and say, hey, what kind of player do you see yourself as? And, and, and using that as a launching off point to, to kind of do some more investigating to see what kind of player they want to become, what their goals are, because those things still matter. And I think it's maybe helping us at least get to know the players a little bit more um, from their point of view, not necessarily from, you know, um, their coach's point of view. Um, and just, you know, taking what they can do and, and talking about their goals. Because at the end of the day, coaching junior college is still about development, number one. Um, and so whether they have the perfect swing for you or not, I think you can still kind of talk to them about what your process is. Um, and sometimes it really, you know, marries up well where their mindset or their swing is exactly what you're looking for. And, and you can kind of kind of develop the rest. You know, it's funny, you know, Kyle Bodie, who runs Driveline, uh, I used to work at Rips um, Baseball in the Seattle area. And, um, he was, he used the facility there for about a year. And so I got to know him a little bit and I got the sh- job at Shoreline um, around that time, five years ago or so, six years ago. And he told me the one piece of advice that he said was develop, develop, develop. You know, he said, if, if, if my son or daughter was going to go play at a junior college, I'd want the coach who was going to be all about development first. And so um, we recruit with that kind of moniker and, and that kind of um, formula and, and it, that's, that, that translates no matter what uh, kind of player you're getting. So, Absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, you, you did mention, you know, it's been a number of years. I mean, even for me to have spring weekends open, I just it just never happens, especially for coaches and players. So with these this time, with these openings that we have, what are things that you're working on personally um, to improve as a coach? And what things are you encouraging your team to do so way they're preparing for, you know, the fall and next school year? Yeah, um, you know, and the, the NMAC has come down with, with, with um, their eligibility criteria for next year. So we've been sharing that with them. Um, we've been talking to some of the sophomores who are making decisions now on are they going to go, you know, pursue their four-year degree? Are they going to come back? And so we've been having those conversations. And um, we're actually going to get quite a few players back that are sophomores. Uh, a couple of them are going to keep moving on with their academic career and don't want to um, stunt that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's mainly just trying to figure out now a plan for development, but also academically and figure out where, what they can do now. Maybe, you know, and there are some silver linings with this too, where, you know, maybe some players were going to have to take 20 credit loads or summer school or something to, to graduate on time. Now they can maybe slow down a bit, um, maybe get that job, um, work on, work on a, a part of their game a little bit more. And so I think for some players, it's a good thing. Um, for others, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's very frustrating. I mean, it's frustrating for all of us to not play, but I think there are some silver linings and we're trying to point those out um, and just kind of, you know, use this as part of the development process and, and extend it out a little bit. But yeah, I mean, there, you know, we have a lot of players from everywhere and we, we check in via Zoom and um, FaceTime and whatnot. And, uh, we kind of go every other week or so with checking in and, um, uh, and, and checking in with, with, with each other and, and just seeing how everyone's doing and just, you know, understanding that it's a tough time and, and whatever support we can give them, um, we're here for. So, Yeah, absolutely. And I know a lot of fans automatically think that sophomores at the junior college level and then seniors at the four-year school level are just automatically going to come back. But the truth is there's a lot of things going on that just don't, you know, allow players to come back or maybe there's just – they just have life decisions they have to make and it does impact teams, it impacts their rosters. And, you know, so obviously that's one thing that you've had to talk with players. And, you know, what are things you're having to talk with, even as like your, your recruits are coming in, what are things that they're having to, or questions they may have coming in? Yeah, I mean, the questions of roster size come into question a bit and, you know, who's coming back, who's not. And so, um, you know, we're going to have a larger roster than we normally do, but again, it's, you know, we, we won't take any players that we don't have a plan for. Um, and I think that's 
really our job as, as JUCO coaches to, to figure out a development plan for everybody. You know, this is a chance for them to get more eyes on them, to get a little bit of college coaching exposure. Um, maybe you're at a smaller school and now you're, you know, playing against players that are as good as you um, and giving yourself a little bit of that, um, that exposure. But yeah, I think they're, they're, they're not asking too many questions. I, th- I think they're, you know, for those high school kids, they're kind of turning the page slowly. You know, now, especially in Washington with graduation, you know, maybe not happening. No high school season for sure not happening. I think they're starting to turn the page a bit um, into college, which is it's, a bit, it's, it's bittersweet from what I've been hearing. Some of them are like, hey, uh, I can't wait to get to Shoreline. Um, some of them, you know, in concert are saying, well, but I'm also super bummed about my high school season and all that. So uh, and everyone's bummed about not having high school softball and baseball. Um, and so for us trying to give them, um, some tools to start working out, um, start working out on their own and, and getting their minds around, um, that they're now a college, college athlete. Yeah, and definitely. And that transition from high school to college, you know, it's, it's a lot bigger than I think a lot of players realize at first they do adapt and get into it. But, you know, for you, you know, you've been coaching at Shoreline. I believe this is what your fifth year at Shoreline. And, but you also coached high school ball before that. What got you into coaching and what really kind of uh, spurred that interest in becoming a coach? Yeah, it, it starts with me being, in, it, well, in high school, I guess I went to Kennedy Catholic here in Burien, um, South Seattle area. And, um, and my playing career wasn't illustrious until about my senior year. Um, I was in and out of JV teams um, and, for me, it was like, you know, did I want to transfer and go to a school where I could play right away? Or, you know, Kennedy, we had a really good, really good squad, really good team. Joe Ficone was our head coach and, you know, won multiple state titles and is, a, is really a legend in, in the WIA. Um, and, you know, he kind of told me to hang on, buy my time, develop, get stronger, get bigger. Our, our philosophy was about the home run ball. That's, I mean, he was a big Yankee fan growing up and, and stuff and so he really loved those teams and loved that style of baseball and and so my job was to develop my game to fit what he wanted and so for three years until I really kind of hit my growth spurt as a senior um, I figured out how to how to I guess before um, figuring out what attack angle was and launch angle uh, measurements were I was doing that as a 14 15 year old to try to get myself in, in you know externally in that in that position to succeed and so just that process of always seeking understanding, I think for me happened at a young age. And so when I got to be, you know, playing a lot more on the varsity level, um, it, it made sense. It kind of all, it, it all clicked in for me, um, all that work. And so at a high school, I, I committed to Green River, um, battled a couple injuries, um, redshirted, was going to kind of redshirt my, my freshman year, ended up um, coaching that, that, that summer. And so ever since that summer of, of coaching, um, as an 18 year old, I hadn't stopped. I've been coaching ever since. And so that bug just, just, just got me and, um, it's taken me to, to really cool places. And, um, and yeah. And so from a young age, I, I was always coaching. And so from then I just kept coaching and now I'm in my 14th year coaching. So. Yeah. And that's one of the things I've realized with a lot of coaches is once they started, it, it almost became something that they, and not that they couldn't live without, but they almost felt like they needed it because it's just, it was so rewarding in a lot of ways. I mean, I've coached uh, obviously younger ages with, with my daughter and stuff like that, but just seeing when a player gets something, when something clicks within them, you, you kind of get that, that sense of excitement that you do when you were playing in, in the same way, but kind of as a, you know, a parent role, but also just as a mentor. Right. Well, and that's what we tell our players too is, is, you know, I think a lot of coaches, they, they coach from their, and there's, there's a way that they coach from how they were coached, you know, and I think that the way to kind of evolve in coaching to get to a point where we, what we tell our players is it might happen, it, it might click in two or three months, it might click in 13 or 14, 15 months, you know, um, just stick to the process and, and the program and, and the plan, and it's going to work out for you, you know, it's not been tried and true that, you know, we, we develop players at a pretty good pace, and so don't freak out that it's not happening overnight for some it will, you know, for Casey head at Ole Miss, it it did, you know, she gravitated towards what we were doing and and her talent was so unique that um, she started balling out from day one. Um, But for some players, you know, it's a little bit of a, of of a slower boat. Um, And it's, it's a whole new set of skills that they're learning. Um, Maybe a whole new level of pitching, maybe a new swing. Um, 
and just, you know, new coaches, so many coaches, so many players have the same coach for so many years throughout club ball and high school ball that, you know, a new voice um, and a new way of doing things is refreshing, but also there's a transition period. So, you know, we always tell them, Hey, it might happen in one or two months. It might happen in, you know, 20 months. So. And then, you know, obviously with, with the season being cut short this year and even before the season was cut short, there were still weather issues, there were different things going on here in the Northwest. But, you know, for you looking at the fall, you know, given that we've missed the springtime and, you know, who knows what the summer's going to be like, what are some goals? What are some things you're going to really focus on in the fall to, you know, get your team back into it, get ready? What's your goal for next spring? Well, I'm hoping that the NWAC allows us to play more games in the fall than we normally get the opportunity to. Um, I would love to start in, the, in August. And it's something that I've talked to my athletic director about, um, maybe talking to, to the NWAC about maybe letting softball get, have an extended fall, fall season to let these players who miss their high school seasons and college players who miss their, their spring season um, a chance to get more playing time, um, maybe have a couple of tournaments in the fall, do something or, you know, to, to develop. Um, but it's, yeah, in the fall, we're going to be all about just trying to create competitive situations with practice more than we normally would. Um, I think a lot of player, a lot of teams are going to have these rosters full of full of really good, talented players. Um, I think there's a trickle down effect that's going to happen with Division One to Two to Three to NAI and all that. And so I think there's gonna, I think the interact's going to be really, really loaded both baseball wise and softball wise next year. And so I think as coaches, it's going to be time to really let them compete and, and let the, the talent come out and, um, and give them those, give them that competition that they so, so much have missed in the last few months. Yeah. I, I know. I've, I mean, I'm just talking with some of the, the baseball guys. I know some of them are freshmen and they're already in the mindset of they got two more years of baseball here at the Juco level. And man, you think about the high schoolers come in, there's going to be really, uh, I, I'm excited for the talent level and, you know, just seeing, where this sport can go in the Northwest, it might be, yes, it'll be challenging for a lot of players because they got to compete for spots, but at the same time, you're going to see players maybe grow or rise to the occasion like never before. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be, you're going to be playing against, you know, grown men and women, you know, 21, 22 year old, you know, where, you know, that's kind of a big recruiting pitch too for junior college coaches is, Hey, come play against players your own age, you know, 18, 19 year olds. And, and now you're going to be seeing some 21 year olds out there um, that are, that are wanting their shot as well. So it's, and again, like we talked about to start this, the podcast, that the NWAC is really, really in a good spot. Coach, there's really good coaches throughout the whole league, um, both in baseball and softball, especially in the North for, for softball. It's, um, I mean, it, it, it's hard for pitchers to get out. So there's so much good offensive talent. There's so many good pitchers as well. Um, it's only going to get better for sure. And then, you know, Ben, right now, obviously, once again, we're, we're not able to do stuff. Not People aren't able to get out to the outside and, and do a whole lot. You can't go have practices. But what advice do you have for individual players who are at home right now thinking, I want to get better. How do I get better? What advice do you have for them? Yeah, I, I, I think what they could do is maybe get a hold of a diamond kinetics or blast sensor. Um, and start kind of researching, um, researching metrics and data. You know, that's something that we do a big, a great deal up here is with one of our assistant coaches, his, his big main job is really to, you know, kind of onboard players with our program. And then we use, you know, internal and external cues to, to get them better. And I think players can do that from, from home, you know, you know, bat on a ball and from a tee into a net. Um, get their readings, play with some things, figure out how to get the proper readings and, and just do some research. I think for players who want to eventually get to the division one level at that high level, you know, PAC 12 SEC softball, you know, they're doing this stuff that, you know, they're, they're really about the technology. And I think um, if players can use this time to start learning that language um, and, and, and kind of figuring out how, what it all means, um, I think it'll be it'll be very beneficial for them getting to college programs that utilize this stuff because uh, that's that's what we believe our part of our job is as well when they get here is hey let's let's teach them the terminology um, and what the, the things that they're going to be learning at the at the the top levels you know I spent a year at Seattle U and so I'm knowing a little bit about you know what what Coach Hira and and those type of coaches are are talking about we can give to our players here 
um, and give them a little bit of a, of a leg up. So. And then Ben, last question I have for you, and this one has actually been brought to me by a couple people who listen because they're just curious, you know, everybody, when they get their glove, they have different ways of breaking in their gloves. So what is your go-to way to breaking in new gloves and just getting them ready to play? <laughs> oh man. Um, I think this, just playing catch, you know, um, you know, again, I grew up we're at a time when, you know, we would play outside all day. You know, I was, t- I was talking to a friend of mine about growing up and, and how, you know, in the summertime we'd be outside all day. And, and I'm not sure if kids do that anymore, but I, I remember talking to a friend and we'd be outside all day playing catch, pitching to each other, um, playing one-on-one basketball and, and stuff like that. And so I, I'm hoping that a lot of kids are getting out and doing as much as they can now. But I think, you know, long toss is definitely a, a social distancing activity. So I, w- I would get as much long toss as possible. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I'm actually loving seeing the videos of guys just throwing it over over lakes and creeks and all that stuff to each other. It's just, it's fun to see. Uh, you know, it's it's a tough time right now, but finding the positive and, and still getting out there and doing stuff, it's it's pretty important for everybody. Yeah, and thanks for, for having this podcast. I mean, I think it's a, a great outlet for coaches and and for, you know, um, students, student athletes to kind of just hear about what's happening and um, get your mind off of uh, some of the news. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, I know for me, that's what I'm doing. This is just a chance to get off of Twitter, get off the TV and just, you know, think about something that I love. And even though I'm missing it, I'm still uh, at least doing something to enjoy it. Yeah, for sure. Well, Ben, thank you very much for coming on and I appreciate it. And good luck uh, once the season gets going next fall. No problem, Josh. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, that is the head coach for Shoreline Community College, uh, Ben. I've actually, once again, never met Ben, but at the same time, I was actually going to cover Shoreline uh, this spring, and then because of weather, I wasn't able to cover the game. It got moved to a different location because uh, they were playing against Lower Columbia here, my uh, the hometown team, kind of local team that I cover. And so, you know, it's just it's awesome to see. And people, once again, they don't realize that the Northwest has talent in softball and in baseball. There's lots of talent up here, lots of great programs. I mean, even the programs that, you know, maybe don't have that rich, deep history are still developing great players and sending them on to four-year schools. And so it's exciting to see. Um, I'm excited to see where Shoreline goes in the next few years, uh, the way they improve and just keep going. So, Guys, once again, this whole podcast is all about just finding ways to stop thinking about what's going on around us and just have some relief, some time to breathe, some time to think about the games that we love and talk about those for a little bit. And that's why, once again, I'm pumped. The fact that I'm getting people messaging me and asking to be on the podcast because that brings me so much joy because I know that what I'm doing here is working in some way or another it's working and it means a lot to me so guys with that i'm going to close this one out just by saying thank you to all of you for listening thank you to those of you who are supporting me through patreon or any other way you're doing it it just means a lot to me thank you guys so much till next time which will be tomorrow when i actually got justin Mosier on he is the general manager for the highline bears uh baseball the summer league baseball team so check that out tomorrow going to be a lot of fun got more people lined up and right now i think on my calendar i have let's see five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve i got like 15 people already on my calendar for this month and more coming on so we're doing good we're having fun talk to you guys later i am josh the nine inning know-it-all